So there was a lot of different areas that I was wanting to go for this particular series. We was going to be talking about Laodicea, and I may touch on that a little bit, but the main part of Laodicean church will probably be next week, so you might call this part one. But I want to kind of tie in a few other things that we're going to be discussing. Uh, obviously, the timing of this being the end of October, uh, October 31st, there's kind of a big day that happens for the pagan world uh, during that time. So we're going to cover a little bit about that. But uh, and then also I want to tie in some more about the mountains of God, uh, you know, and uh, the Babylonian kingdom, uh, the ziggurats that are all over the world and that type of thing. But anyway, there is a uh, there's a reference. If you want to bring up that uh, uh, place in Gilgal, there's a it's almost like Stonehenge. But this is in the northeastern part of of uh, uh, east of Syria. I believe, I'm not sure if it's in Jordan or not, or uh, still in Israel or in Syria, one of the two. But that's an area that was, uh, they believed that was probably pre-flood, uh, possibly, or post-flood. But it was, it was almost like the, uh, 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 you can't even, uh, just look at, bring up the next slide if you would. That's an aerial view. Most people did not even know that existed the way it is until they had an aerial view of it. Uh, because it's so huge, they thought it was just a fence for farmland. Uh, you're seeing it in a, trying to get all of it together in one thing. But that was where some of the, uh, almost like what happened with the uh, ziggurats in the Tower of Babel area, that was something that if you want to study a little bit more, uh, 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 just go ahead and go back to that if you would, to the other one, if you want to study a little bit more. That the Gilgal, Raphaim, it's where some of the giants, I think they were trying to make connection with the, um, uh, you know, the gateway to heaven, you might say. So uh, you can bring up the next slide if you would. Uh, and we'll stay there for right now. Uh, but that's uh, some of the ziggurats that in the Babylonian area. Uh, after the Tower of Babel, uh, which could possibly have been uh, different than that, there's the, some of the research I had done actually said that uh, uh, Nimrod obviously did the Tower of Babel, but the... Uh, Babylonian king uh, Nebuchadnezzar is probably the one that that built these ziggurats. Uh, go to the next one if you would. I'm 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 messing with you. Uh, we may come back to some of these. That one on the left. Uh, once once the uh, uh, Tower of Babel that you know obviously Babel had went into all you know the, d dispersed the people, and they went into all the world. They began to build different uh, either pyramids or ziggurats all over the world. The one on the left, you can look at Google uh, uh, Earth. That is what's called the Great White Pyramid of China. There's a lot of pyramids in China that they don't want to talk about because it obviously it, it uh, proves the Bible and some of the other things that's going on. The one on the right is, a, is kind of an artist's rendition of what it might have looked like uh, during that time. Let's look at the next one, if you would. Uh, I don't know where in the world that is. Um, no, I'm teasing. That's obviously the Giza Plateau. Uh, as a just for just for honoriness, I'm I'm a builder uh, also. I've built several buildings, commercial buildings, and did design work and houses and whatever. And so and that didn't happen until I got saved. I didn't even know how to cut a line, uh, you know, down the saw and get it until God taught me how to do all that stuff. Uh, but anyway. Um, as a builder perspective, uh, most people don't know it, but most buildings are not perfect. If you live in a house <laughs> for a long period of time, that's why they don't call it a built. They call it a building because you're still working on it for years. Uh, but to have a, uh, a building that by laser technology today that is so precise, it just blows you away, is, is unbelievable, for, especially for somebody that's an architect or builder or whatever, engineer. And there is, uh, there is uh, I don't know whether to call it caverns or, or areas in the biggest pyramid in, in Giza that they have big slabs that are there that they've taken lasers and put it on the inside, the lab slabs of granite that's in there, and it's just perfect. I mean, it's absolutely perfect, and that's not, it's unreal about what, you know, obviously there's a lot of things that go on about why people built uh, personally. This is my own opinion. It's not thus saith the Lord. It's my own opinion. I think either the pyramids of Giza 
or the, uh, what's that big lion thing, uh, the Sphinx, was pre-flood. The, the pyramids may not be. I tend to think that the uh, Sphinx might have been because of the water erosion, but I don't know. That's my own opinion. Uh, but uh, that's probably not, that's not thus saith the Lord. That's thus saith Doug trying to figure out why there's so much water erosion on there. So let's go to the next one. Talk about water erosion. This is a underwater pyramid. Uh, I believe it's in China. It's in a lake. There's an entire city that was in, buried in water, and they're try and they're still discovering it today. In the upper right-hand corner, is showing where they have went down into the into this lake, and they have found these pyramids. And there's pyramids all over the world. Uh, ziggurats and pyramids that are all over the world. I mean, this is, I'm just giving you a little bit of taste of what's going on. Uh, let's go to the next one. Does anybody know where that is? That's a pyramid about two hours from us. Cahokia Mounds down by St. Louis. Um, and that is, uh, you know, they, they were, there's pyramids that was built in America. They don't want, they don't want to talk about that history that's here, there's actually a serpentine snake-like thing that's out in the Ohio area, too. Uh, and there's stuff like that that's all over the world that's pagan issues and stuff. But go to the next one, if you would. Does anybody know what that pyramid is? <laughs> Amazing that we're having the pyramids on, the, on our, talking about the New World Order, you know, uh, and the all-seeing eye obviously sh showing that it's not... Uh, going yet, but that, that is the representative of Satan that's on the top there, the all-seeing eye of, of Satan, you know, at the top of the pyramid. Let's go to the next one, if you would. And we will stop right there for right now and just let you wonder what in the world that is, okay? All right, so that'll give you an idea of kind of some of the stuff that's going on, but as I was studying this, I want to take you to, let me see if I can find my notes. Talk. I printed those dudes off and I didn't bring them. Isn't that amazing? Well, let's turn anyway to uh, <laughs> Isaiah chapter 2. Thank God I'm doing this by memory then. I think we're going to study in the Bible today. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Carla, would you do me a favor? Would you go print these off for me somewhere? In my office, maybe. Okay. It's, uh, I don't know, there's only like four or five things on there, but it's... It's called notes. It's called uh oh. I don't have my notes. <laughs> amen. Amen. That's what I was. That's what I was thinking. All right. Now, uh, what what I'm bringing up is as I was studying for this message, and as I'm going through some of the stuff that I was learning about the end times, the last days, and whatever else, and trying to refresh everything, um, I was. Basically, just meditating after that, and I felt like the Holy Spirit told me to go to Isaiah chapter 2. And I thought, okay, all right, I'll go there. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm like, is this, I, I felt like that's what God was telling me to do. So I'm going to Isaiah chapter 2, and I want to I read this to you. And we'll probably, it's pretty long, so I don't want to go through all of it. We'll go through it as the message goes on. Um, but Isaiah chapter 2, uh, it says, I'll read, start with verse 2. It says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall, shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall, shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountains of the Lord. To the house of the God of Jacob, he will teach us his ways. He will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. He shall beat, they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. This is a, there's so much to be unpacked with this. This is a uh, reference, in my opinion, about the millennial kingdom that's getting ready to happen, uh, where uh, all of the, and there's, a, there's another reference actually from this, it's in Micah, uh, also in Micah, I think it's Micah chapter 1, uh, that's actually almost identical to this in saying that. 
But I, what I wanted to bring out here was it says, it says, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. The point I was trying to bring up, and we did this before in one of the sessions, um, think with me back, uh, I know uh, you guys are probably not this old as I am like that, but think with me back to pre-flood time in the Garden of Eden, and the Garden of Eden was where Adam and Eve were, but that was a garden in Eden. It's not just the Garden of Eden, the whole earth is the Garden of Eden, that's not what it is. The Garden of Eden was a garden in Eden, okay? And if you, if you uh, in the research that I've done, it's talking about, I believe there was actually a mountain on the earth during that time. They called it the Lord's Mountain, or the, uh, it was the area where uh, God had actually dwelt with his council, the council of God, uh, that there was other actual beings. And there's a reference to that in Psalms, talking about that Elohim will speak with Elohim. Elohim is not God's name. It's a, if you look at Elohim or Elohim, it's actually meaning spiritual beings is what it means. Little gods or whatever else, they are spiritual beings. Uh, that's why it's not Yahweh is, is more reference to God's name as opposed to uh, Elohim or Elohim. Uh, but in that sense, so all spiritual beings like the counsel of God, thank you, sweetheart, the counsel of God, uh, I, could, I wanted it on both sides. I'm going to talk to you <laughs> don't go there right? okay all right <laughs> oh well boy it's getting hot in here isn't it no, okay. <laughs> so anyway the uh the lord would meet with his counsel and actually uh if you think about that also whenever the lord was meeting with his counsel at different times where they would call, like if you say in Job, where they called all of the council together, and it says, and Satan showed up, or Lucifer showed up during that time, during this council that was going on, and you know, that was in Job, and it was talking about that. So if you get the picture of the fact is that God would beat with his council, and it says, let us make man in our image. In the beginning, most people try to relate that to the, tr the Trinity, but in reality, God was almost like saying, we're, go we're going to make man. He's talking to his council. We're going to make man. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And then he's, he says, and I will do that. So there's a council, what's called the council of God. And so God would meet with, uh, uh, on the mountains and he would dwell in the high places. God has always had this, uh, you know, if you think about it, Jesus taught on the sermon of the, Jesus was transfigured on the, Lots of different things happen on the mountains in that area. And what would happen is that God met with, you know, that he would be on the mountain. I believe there was an area in pre-flood world in the garden area in, the, in Eden that was actually a mountain. They called the mountain of God because historically after that, it was it, people as if the same way with Noah's flood. There was so many in so many different languages and different uh, nationalities that people would talk about Noah's flood. They would say this happened because they're making reference to an actual event that happened. In the same way, we look at the mountain of God and they, they, they has been passed down throughout the ages talking about that we know that those are where the gods meet. They're in the mountains, they're in those areas. In the same way that whenever we have after the flood, post-flood, we have Nimrod, who was one of the first ones that uh, you know, actually started, you know, the gathering everybody together. God had commanded them to go out and fill the earth. And actually Nimrod means to, uh, to rebel against God. He was, re he was rebellious against God. And they, uh, they have, they're building this tower, the Tower of Babel, which means gateway to God is actually what it means. In Hebrew, it's, it's the gateway to God. So they're building this tower. Now there's several different, like I'd said before, there's several different reasons why the possibility of why they were building it the way they were doing. You could look at it because they, they were rebelling against God and they said one way is that we're going to provide our own way of salvation. We don't care about God, so we're going to worship these entities, uh, the angelic beings that had fallen, and they'll do that in a certain way. And I, and I, would, I would beg the question to you also, if it didn't have some significance, people would not do that. 
you wouldn't have it through the years. Think about it with if you were a uh, an atheist and you have all of these people that are believers in Christianity throughout the ages and they're trying to understand why they would do that. You would look at it from an atheist standpoint to the Christianity and you would say there must be something about that. Otherwise, all throughout these years, all these people would not be deceived. They wouldn't be deceived. So on the other side of the coin, God obviously warns us not to be like that because there is end results that happens because of their activity that they do. Don't worship those idols. Don't worship those other gods. Don't worship those things. So it's not people that's just worshiping some inanimate object and not getting anything out of it. Believe me, they get something out of that. And it's not obviously what we would get out of worshiping God. They, they're being deceived and whatever else. We, we understand that. But there is something that's going on. And that's why, so it's either that they were trying to say, we're going to provide our own way of salvation and we're going to do our works. We're going to build these edifices. We're going to lift up, uh, you know, they're trying to, and Satan obviously as the controller over that would mimic God. So these, go back if you would to some of the pyramids, if you would. Uh, yeah, let's go back. Yeah, stay, stop there if you would. Uh, so they would actually mimic God. So once ever the Tower of Babel had uh, collapsed or whatever happened to that, whenever they built the ziggurat and whatever else, and you get people that are scattered all over the earth, that's why they go into South America, Central America, China. I mean, all over the world, even, even in buried pre-flood. That's why I say there's some things that was probably pre-flood that got buried in that's still under the water. You can look in areas that's actually still under the water uh, from the floods, from the flood days, you know, and stuff. And that would be these particular things because Satan was wanting to mimic the mountain of God. He wants to be worshiped. That's why it also says in Ezekiel and Isaiah, it says that, that uh, Satan was cast down off of the mountain of God. You were, you were whatever, you know, you're the king of Tyre or whatever else, you were cast down. You walked in the, gar you know, the garden, you did all these things, but you were cast off of the mountain of God. So he's always tried to reestablish his authority all throughout the earth. Now go, go back to the dollar bill, if you would, which is one of the reasons why we still see that occultic symbol for the end times. That is no accident that that's on our particular money. I hate to say that, but that's part of the underlying infiltration, deep state, whatever you want to call them, that are trying to say, we believe eventually there's going to be one world government, one world, new world order, whatever it is. So those are things that, that are going on. That's not just some symbol. And as much as I hate to say this, I'm going to anyway. Please don't throw stones at me afterwards. There's a statue in New York Harbor called the Statue of... That's an occultic pagan statue. Yes. You can look at that particular statue in pre... Uh, uh, whether it was pre-flood or post-flood, that actually about the, the, the thing that's wrapped around them. I mean, there's that, that image has been around for years and years and years. And that was one of the things that quite possibly was a, a, a symbol, uh, you know, of Dionysus or something else or whatever, uh, Esther. Uh, I mean, there's different ones that you could say, but you can look into the history of the Statue of Liberty. Obviously, we look at it from a different standpoint as Americans. But they, in, in the pagan uh, world, they always say, they're basically deceiving us right in the open is the way they look at things. Uh, they look at occultic symbols and certain things that are, that are basically out there. We look at them as in a whole total different way, but on the pagan side, they have a totally different meaning of what's going on. Uh, the Masonic symbols are similar to that and whatever else. You see some of those things. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I mean, we could go on and on and on talking about symbols. There's another one that's... Uh, 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 never mind. <laughs> never mind. It's not, it's not worth it. But anyway, so the mountain of God is something that has been mimicked all over the earth. And that's what Satan has tried to reestablish again. Another way is that the Tower of Babel, like I'd said before, uh, that they wanted to reach the heavens. Some, some believe that they could actually build a, an edifice so high they wanted to be able to knock on the door of God and say, we're taking over. That's, that's one of the things that they had thought of, you know, whether that 
Last one is, and I'm sure there's even more than that, but last one is the fact that it might have been a gateway. So you're either worshiping entities as a pagan religion, which is a high probability of all of that, but nevertheless, Babel means gateway to God. So whether that was a, a gateway of a, a portal that they were trying to recreate to go back to heaven to be able to, to have this war with God, or it was actually something that was uh, put the saying in their rebellion, maybe, maybe they was building it high enough that they said, okay, God, you go ahead and flood the world again. We'll build this high enough that there's no way you're going to be able to reach over the top of what we're doing. I mean, that's, that's a possibility too. Whatever the issue is, that is some of the things that God, uh, that the enemy has done all over the earth. And so we look at some of those things and we think, you know, it's unreal how we see those. Go back to, uh, go back to the next one, if you would, there. Let's go. Yeah, there we go. Does anybody know what that is? What is it? It looks like a portal, doesn't it? I mean, it looks like a portal. Um, Mm -hmm. Psalms 22. Psalms 22. Is that in the New Testament or Old Testament? Where, where was that? Psalms 22. Verse 1 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and I am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, not a man, and a reproach of men despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out of the lip, and they shake their head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Wasn't that one of the thieves on the cross said to Jesus? Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me to trust while my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb. You have been my God, but not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none that help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging, whirring lion. And I'm going to stop there for a second, because I want you to remember uh, verse 12 and 13. Many bulls are surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan who have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging, roaring lion. The bulls of Mashan is not actual bulls. Actually, that area in the northeastern area of Israel. Go back to the first slides, if you would. There you go. That area, go to the next one, if you would. Go back to it. Yeah, there we go. In that area, there was, uh, um, uh, you know, where they, they said there was grazing, but uh, there was the area that was a little bit south of that, that it was more like a desert. It was almost like Salt Lake Flats or something. They're saying the Bashan area, uh, you know, was actually, it was not really good for grazing. There was a person that had done some study for that. There was no way that it was actually physical bulls that was being grazed in this area. But we know this is a reference of Jesus being on the cross, talking about the bulls of Bashan. The bulls of Bashan, uh, go back to that gateway if you would. Uh, the bulls of Bashan actually were a reference to some of the giants, the, the Nephilim, the giants of that area and whatever else where it was saying that they were after Jesus when he was, after he had died, uh, that they was going after him and whatever else, the bulls of Bashan. Uh, this particular, let's go to the next one. This thing is called, I believe it's called a doodrum, a doldrum. I think it's called a doldrum. Uh, it is actually a uh, historically, what this would do, the people that were wanting to bury their dead would place them upon these tables. Go to the next one. They would place them upon these tables and they would bury their dead like that. They would lay them out onto these tables. And these, uh, uh, these actual things are all over in that area of Bashan. 
and the northern area of Gilgal, uh, they're, they're everywhere. It, it is crazy to see all the things that they had. Now, on the pagan side, they believed, you know, have you seen where they would put the coins on the people's eyes whenever they would bury them to say that the, whoever it was that was coming to take them, they would have to be able to pay the, you know, the piper or whoever else. They're paying these people to carry them on into the underworld and whatever else, they'd put these coins on their, on their faces and their heads and whatever else. But this area was an interesting little thing because Jesus makes reference to this. We looked at what's going on with the bulls of Bachan, but let's look in Psalms chapter 23. One of the most famous quoted parcels of scripture. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. This area was the portal that people used to believe that they would take their dead to. And there was, there was a lot of activity that was going on in these areas with these things that were happening that they called it the, the shadow of death. There's another term, let's, let's go back, there's another term that makes reference to this. Uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Jesus was going through that, he was making reference to going through this area where they, were buried, they buried their dead in that. And it says here, it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's what he's talking about. I have this table that transfers me to that realm that is actually saying there's a difference. You're preparing me the table that I need before my enemies. It says here, you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. There's a reference to that they used to, like on on Halloween and whatever else that's coming up, they would feed the dead. Uh... Historically, that is what really Halloween, it's not just that the, uh, the thing from the Scottish area, but it's, it's, there's other areas from years ago where they, they felt like that they had to feed the dead. So they would set out foods in these areas, the table that's before my enemies. They, they would set out food, they would put out food because they knew at the certain times where that the Halloween area was the closest to the spirit realm that we could possibly be in the calendar that we was at. And so they knew that was, that's why they called it the Day of the Dead, the next day, the day, whatever. But it was a closest place where they would, they would go over to the spirit realm. So they supposedly the ancestors would come back and actually uh, want to be fed. So if you really want to take care of your ancestors, you would feed them, you'd lay out, you'd give them drinks, you would lay out whatever else. They actually had a cup where they would leave a cup. There was a king that had been buried in one of these areas that they laid out a cup for him. And that cup obviously didn't have anything in it. But Jesus says, my cup is running over. He's making, he's, we, we look at it in, in, you know, God has taken him through the death realm. We look at it in a certain way, but Jesus is, he's, he's, he's speaking to those entities God has prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies. My cup is running over. You don't have to worry about what it is. God is my provider in the midst of this. And that's what he's saying to these areas. And and if you think about it, the actual action of trick or treat, because what would happen is on Halloween, uh, you know, or these dead people would come back. And if you didn't have any food for them, they would mess with you. That's where the, we still do that today. I'm going to come to your door and you're going to give me a treat or I'm going to trick you. That's where that came from. It's the return of the dead that's coming to be able to mess with the uh, poltergeist, whatever you want to call them, you know, or coming to mess with you to believe the spirit realms. Now, we obviously know that, that your ancestors are not coming back to life to talk to them. Those are demonic spirits. If you think you're talking to your dead ancestor, you're not. You're talking to a familiar spirit. 
So whenever my, I think my dead dog is talking to me, I know that's not him. He's, he's, that's not him barking. It's, you know, it's a familiar spirit. That's why they call him dog. I'm, never mind. So anyway, God, Jesus is telling him, says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's look in Psalms 24. The earth is the Lord and all of its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Uh, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He who has not lifted up his soul to, to an idol and nor sworn de deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from his God and salvation. And Jacob and his generation of those who seek him, who seek the face. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. Go back to that portal, if you would. Go back to the one that looks like a portal. There you go. Because he's saying here, this is not the physical gates. These are talking about, they used to think that there was uh, porters that would allow people in, whether or not into the realm of the dead or whatever else. And there's people that, that would stand there and they would say, lift up your, your heads, O ye gates, and O your doors, because the king of glory is coming in. Jesus is making reference to whenever he was going into the, the deepest parts of the grave. And he's actually, he's not preaching to the spirits in prison to get them saved. He's speaking to the person, spirits in prison that are prison down there saying, I'm the king. I'm the one that is in charge. He's telling them, basically he's giving them their, their sentence anyway in that way. And, and, you know, and, and so he's looking at that as saying, oh, you gates, all the ones that are the, the, the guardians of that area, because I'm here, in other words. Amen? Amen. Jesus is the, uh, so the bulls of Bashan, let's see here. Reference to the netherworld. Let me see if I can, I might want to make sure I'm covering all this. Um, in Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1, it says, At that time the Lord will punish with his destructive, great, and powerful sword. Leviathan, the fast-moving moving serpent, Leviathan, the squirming serpent, he will kill this, the sea monster. That was God making reference to what's going to happen uh, in the end times where God eventually is going to be this, this war between the two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem, the war between the mountains of God, and then also go to the, go to the next one, if you would keep going. Next one, next one, that one there. This is called the Auroral Boris. Has anybody ever seen this before? That's uh, uh, symbolism of of creation from a pagan standpoint, uh, new age, whatever else, it, it's the eternal thing. It's, it's also that reference right there. Let me read to you what that actually is. Uh, it's originating in ancient Egyptian icono iconography. Uh, the Aurora Boris entered into the tradition via the Greek magic tradition, was adopted as a symbol of Gnosticism and Hermeticism, and the most notably in alchemy. The term derives from ancient Greek, the Aurora Boris often interpreted as a symbol for eternal life or renewal, the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. Uh, the process of snakes uh, symbolizes the transmigration of souls. The snake biting its own tail is a fertility symbol. The tail of the snake is a phallic symbol, and often the mouth, the womb-like symbol. But first known appearance of the Aurora Boris Monif, enigmatic book of the netherworld, the ancient Egyptian funerary, the tomb of King Tut, in the 14th century BC, the text concerns the actions of God Ra and his union with Osiris in the underworld. The Aurora Boris depicted twice on the figure holding their tails in their mouths, one encircling the head and the upper chest, the other surrounding the feet of the large figure, which may represent the unified Ra Osiris, born again as Ra. Both serpents are manifestations of deity mayhem which is other funerary texts, pro, uh, protects Ra in the underworld journey. The whole divine figure represents the beginning of the end of time. The Aurora Boris appears elsewhere in Egyptian sources, while many Egyptian serpent deities. It, re it represents the formless disorder that, that surrounds the orderly world involved in the world's periodic renewal. The symbol persisted in Egypt in Roman times. Now, the one thing I want to bring out about this, this Aurora Boris uh, actually 
is symbolic also of the dragon, Leviathan, that God is going to deal with. But it also is talking about the Aurora Bors is, is the king, you might say, is the entity that talks about, um, oh, I what is the word for that? It's chaos, you might say. The stuff that's going on in our world today where they're actually, uh, the, they're crying out for chaos. I don't know if you know this or not, but the, uh, the people that are rioting in the streets, whatever else that's going on, they're actually praising the gods of chaos and calling for their ancestral gods to come and be a part of what's going on in our, in our world, to call for, uh, you know, for the enemy to take over. They're, they're praising the gods of chaos. This symbol is a god of chaos that happened that's actually uh, symbolic of, of Satan the dragon and whatever else that God is going to be uh, overthrowing. Amen? Uh, uh, in the last days, God says that he is going to, in the, where was I reading at? I think it was in, uh, that God is going to destroy the serpent of the sea. God is going to destroy that serpent. He's actually, that's one of the things that he's planning on doing is taking care of that Serpent, which actually represents the enemy. So, um, amen, amen, amen. But I'm going to go back to Isaiah chapter 2, if you would. Isaiah chapter 2. Verse 8. Oh, wait a minute, let's go with verse 7. Uh, Verse 7, their land is also full of silver and gold. There's no end to their treasures. Their land is also full of horses. uh, There is no end to the chariots. Their land is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands for which their own fingers are made. People bow down and each man humbles himself. uh, Therefore, do not forgive them. This is making a reference to the people of the house of Jacob. And they're, they're allowing soothsayers and the Philistines and their foreigners to envelop them. And this is one of the things that God is saying, all the proud things, all the things that are made with hands, all the things that are silver and gold, that he's going to show himself strong in the last days over these things. In verse 10, it says, enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord, the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, the haughtiness of man shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty. Uh, and it's in verse 17, second part says, The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, but the idols shall utterly be abolished. They shall go into the holes of the rocks. It's talking about the people. Into the caves of the earth for the terror of the Lord. This is during the great tribulation. And the glory of his majesty, which is rises, shall shake the earth mightily. In that day, man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold. In other words, they'll be throwing the gold and the silver in the streets. It doesn't mean anything anymore which they have made for, for, they, uh, for each who himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks, into the crags of the rugged rocks, from the terror of the Lord, the glory of his majesty, which is, arises to shake the earth. So during the tribulation people, period, people will be trying to hide themselves from the wrath of God. Uh, God is, he says, I'm coming and I'm going to destroy every high lofty thing. Go back to the mountains, if you would or the pyramids, everything that's going, that was been high and lifted up, go, go to the, yeah, there you go. Everything that's been exalted, even the things made by man, everything that we worship is going to be decimated. God is going to destroy all high places. Everything that the enemy has tried to come against and say, we, that is our God, that is our loftiness, that is our way of being able to fight against God, God says, that's it, it's going to be destroyed. Everything that lifts themselves up, everything that we worship, the gold, the silver, the things made with man, all of it will be humbled and before the the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. God will humble all those things. He's going to show his power over every everything that's built by man that we trust into, whether it's the horses, the chariots, whether it's our own uh, uh, selfish ambition, whatever it is, God says, this is the challenge that I'm coming against and I'm going to destroy it all. And God will destroy those things. Everything's going to be broken down. It's the ultimate battle that Satan is going against God that have, that we are a part of this whole, we've stepped into eternity that is happening right now that's been going on uh, since the beginning. 
And that, that's one of the things that God is doing. This whole, uh, the battle lines have been drawn. That's why God is showing himself in strong. And every, every single other, whether it's the, the area of the dead, go back to the portals, if you would, and the, the tables, the rocks, the area of the dead where they transpire over into the underworld, the underneath world. God shows them strong in those areas. Go back to the next, go next again, keep going. And lastly, we got, I don't believe this is the gate of hell, but they've, they've, te- they've called it that. This is in, I believe, in Russia. And it was a, it was a hole that was, uh, they don't know where the bottom is, but it was uh, uh, going methane gas. Uh, that was, so they lit it on fire, and it's been burning since the 70s. And they can't put it out. Um, you know, and that's, that's, uh, that kind of looks like hell, doesn't it, I guess? I don't know. I haven't been there lately, but I don't know. Does anybody else, you know, know whether that's correct or not? But uh, I just believe that God is going to show himself strong in these last days because I, I want to give you a glimpse, a little bit more of a study on what the, why the mountains, why the pyramids, why all these things that are lifted up. The Babylonian uh, culture that has been uh, part of the end time uh, mythology throughout the years, everything being uh, worshipped in that area. That's going to culminate once again. It's going to get to the place where it's going to be the ultimate standoff during the, the Great Tribulation uh, period. That's going to be the, the, all that Satan has that he's going to put out is going to be fought against against God and his kingdom. And those are the things. So I'm kind of giving you an overview of what the war really is going on that has been that way. Satan has always mimicked himself to try to look like God, go back to the pyramids again, you know, and stuff, that's, or the dollar bill, I guess. That's, that's why he is saying, you know, he's trying to establish. And think about this. The, the U.S. is the most powerful country in the world. There's no doubt about it. I mean, hands down, we are. And yet the enemy tries to come in to corrupt the people that are in power to do stuff like this, to be able to control the end times events and whatever else. Why do you think Donald Trump has so much problem with dealing with the deep state the people are there whether the presidents are there or not you know uh i was getting ready to tell i'll tell you privately if you ask me but i seen a vision uh uh, whenever we was looking at the uh the what was that happened the debate the other night i seen a vision of of something god showed me about uh biden um so i'm not going to say that on the air but uh if you want to know and it's not that I'm afraid of that. I'm, I'll tell you anyway. But I'm just write me. I'll tell you. I don't care. Uh, but anyway, I just want to. I want to share that. I think is is kind of interesting. But you know, part of the church responsibility, and I'm going to tell you this though, part of the church responsibility as we, as the church of God, the people of God. Now, this is a dream that I had, and it kind of shook me to the core a little bit. Um, this dream that I had the other night, this was uh, this week, uh, I had dreamed that I wasn't the instigator of it, but I wasn't also stopping it. I wasn't causing anything to stop it, but these people had actually gathered to like about 10 people together, and uh, the next thing I seen in the dream is they would, they'd bound them up, they had actually made them strip, they'd bound them up really tight, like they're on top of each other, just the way that during World War II, how the bodies were laid on top of each other. And they were going to sacrifice them by fire. They was going to kill them alive and burn them by fire. And I said, I can't, I got to do something. I can't stand for this. And so I, I'm like going to call the police. And then the people are telling me, well, you're going to get in trouble too because you were part of it. I said, I don't care. I've got to do the right thing. I have got to stop this. And and so I... Uh, uh, you know, somebody else was calling the police, but while they were coming to, to before I could let them catch these people on fire, I actually uh, helped me and some other people actually got them unbound and got them clothed and started giving them water and whatever else and got them set free. And then I woke up. And so, uh, you know, I, I was looking at that and uh, there's lots of different things I was telling Carla about it. She goes, well, you know, that's part of our responsibility as Christians. People that are bound to go to hell it's our responsibility to rescue them. Amen. Amen. Did you have something? This week I saw a picture, a vision of President Trump being tied down and the enemy, the people that were fighting against him, say, go ahead, fight, fight, and he was tied down. But we, the Christians, are supposed to untie him and lead him and let him go. 
Amen. 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 That's good. That's good. Amen. I, that, I believe that. I believe that. We have the responsibility for us to pray for our nation like ever before and pray because as, as the U.S. goes, it, it influences the world. Uh, whether they whether they like it or not, they do. That's why everybody all over the world's all doing this mask thing, you know, and whatever else. Even if they don't have COVID, they don't care. They like masks, I guess. I don't know. Uh, you know. Uh, but anyway, so we need to be our responsibility. Don't forget the mission that God has called us to to set people free from the bondage of hell. Amen. That's our goal. That is really our goal. Any way that you can ever lead somebody to the Lord, it's real easy. You just ask, say, would you like to accept Jesus? Do you believe that he died for you on a cross? You know, do you believe that he rose again from the dead? Yes, and you want to be saved? Yes, and you lead him in the prayer. Say, I, Father, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. You know, it's real easy to do. I know it's scary, but it's real easy to do. If you've never done it, try it. Uh, grab somebody behind the Walmart checkout counter and tell them <laughs> hey, whatever it is. I don't know. Uh, uh, but anyway, did you have something? Um, can I do a little short yes, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Do you want that on on recorded? Okay. Uh, amen. 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 Good. Good. What, what's your name? Uh, my name is Scott. And <laughs> my last name is Root. And How long um, have you been an alcoholic? Oh, I'm not about uh, 25 years. So. <laughs> Um, I've been studying curses and blessings this week, and uh, I, something happened to me Thursday that really just kind of changed my life. Um, years ago, well, let me say this, the, the definition of an occult is that which is hidden or covered, and I learned the definition of a, a curse is an invisible, hidden uh, course sent against you to hinder you to hinder your life. Well, I was listening to uh, an audible book by Derek Prince about curses and blessing. And to make this story short, I won't go too long with it. Um, when I heard this, he was talking about dragons that were hung in his house um, that the Lord told him to get rid of because it was a curse unto him and it was hindering his life, hindering his ministry, hindering his house. And when I heard that, the Lord spoke to me about something that I've had since I was 17 years old. And the Lord spoke to me and said, that which was given to you as a gift has been a curse to you all these years. It's hindered your progress. It's hindered you and your marriage. It's hindered you and your finances. It's hindered you and your ministry. It's hindered your life. Um, and you need to get rid of it. So I began to think about this. Um, my uncle, when I was 17, gave me this jade uh, article and he also gave my father a piece of it and one of them is like a a man with a fish and all this stuff but I've, I've kept this for all these years as a gift he gave me and I, I just want to say this that sometimes the enemy can be so subversive he'll give you something as a gift and it's really a curse to you and it blinds you to the to what it is because you it's a gift, you know, it's given to you as a gift, and you think, wow, this is awesome, so I've kept it all these years. But I just want to, I just feel like I should speak this to you that some of you may have a gift that's been given to you through the years that you've kept, and it's, it's in your house. It, it's something that is actually a subversive act by the enemy that's actually a curse to you. It's hindering your life. It's hindering your house. It's, it's hindering your walk. You, you get so far and, and something happens to you that you can't explain. And I just thought I was supposed to, to just speak that. So I got this out last night, showed it to my wife, and I'm trying to figure out if this thing is a, a god or not from China. But I guess ultimately it doesn't matter, you know, what it is or where it came from. The Lord spoke to me and said, get that out of your house. Um, and... You know, just a little transparent, but, you know, my wife and I have communication problems sometimes. And uh, it always happens mostly in our office where this thing has been all this time. So, I don't know, it's just a thought. Um, 
But it would, it would amaze me that I've had this all these years. And I, I know about curses. I know about objects that can curse things. I've cleansed my house before. But I was deceived. This was hidden to me because I always looked at this as being a gift. You know, this is a gift my uncle gave me. You know, it's really cool. I really like it because, you know, I just really, I've always really kept care of this thing. But I began to think about that since I was 17 when I received that is when a lot of stuff started to happen in my life that I couldn't really explain. So I just, I just felt like I was supposed to give you that as a testimony um, because that which is hidden to you, you know, is deception. And it can be something that you don't realize is hindering your life spiritually, your prayer life, your understanding of the Lord, uh, your walk with God, your finances, your marriage, your life, whatever it is. Um, but I just felt like I was supposed to speak that out because we're talking about, you know, all these things, all these articles and all these things today. And I just felt like, you know, Pastor Doug talked about his blanket mm -hmm. that he had last week. You know, it was in his house. So I just want to speak that forward to you. Um, just pray and ask the Lord, is there something in your house? Because the days that we live in, you know, whatever the enemy has that's against you will rise up. And, and it will hinder you and, you, and you have no reason why it's happening to you. Because you just, you know, it's something that, it just happens. You know, and if there's a pattern in your life that seems like you get to a certain point in your life and something happens to you, it could just possibly be there's something in your house like I have all these years. So I'm just like, wow, you know, I'm just blown away by this. That I've had this all these years and it's been a curse to me. So I just want to, I just want to, put that out there to you because um, it was a gift you know and, and I treated it I didn't see it as anything else and I, I've kept it all these years as this gift but really it's been a curse you know that's how subversive the enemy is to our lives so it's so important in the times that we live to humble ourselves and to to really just say Lord is there is there anything in my life that's hindering me that's been a curse to me that that I didn't see and if there is, Lord, just, just show me. And I, I believe that that could be a key in some of our lives to set us free. Just a, just a thought. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Scott. You know, that, that word ox could be for somebody in your family, too. It doesn't necessarily have, have to be just you. Uh, it could be for, you know, if you've if you got family members that are having problems, maybe, maybe there's an issue that's going on they don't even realize, you know, and stuff. And so... I believe there's things that, that are like that, that spirits attach themselves to certain things, images and whatever else that we have allowed in our, in our homes sometimes. Uh, and so, you know, like wearing an upside down cross or something, that's not a, not a good thing, not a good thing. Well, stand to your feet if you would. Father, we just pray in the name of Jesus for supernatural blessings over our lives. Father God, I pray that you illuminate our hearts if there's anything that would be subversive. Father, that would cause hindrance to our spiritual walk. Father God, I pray that you reveal those things to us, whether it's an activity that we allow ourselves to do, whether it's actually an, an image in our article or a pagan symbol or whatever it is, Father God, that would cause us uh, to be hindered in some way, Father God. We just believe right now in the name of Jesus for the victory that's coming uh, over the world, Father God, that you are, you are establishing your kingdom Father, all over all of the gateways, over all the portals, over all the areas that the enemy has tried to rein in. Father, we just thank you right now in Jesus' name that you are the powerful God, the almighty God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Father, we just praise you for those things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, God bless, guys. I hope you got something out of it. And uh, we'll see you next week.